Case in point, another one of these stories that was in my little to-do topic file that I found this morning had to do with something and that's so recent, by the way, it's still unfolding. So pardon me if this story isn't quite correct by the time you get this show. Here's where it stands now, though. There was a stock trader or a guy who purported to be a stock trader who did an interview uh, with the BBC the other day. And apparently some of the BBC people in the studio were shocked by it. But the purported stock trader basically said, and I'm going to quote him kind of out of context probably, but he basically said that the world economy is going to go to hell and no one's going to fix it. And no one's going to fix it because none of these countries are really in charge or calling the shots. Goldman Sachs is in charge in calling the shots. And they don't want this, so it's not going to happen. Goldman Sachs runs the world. Now, since that time, some have made charges that this guy might be one of um, a group of hoaxers and pranksters called the Yes Men. When last I checked on the story, that's being doubted a little bit, but it's still possible. But if the guy is real, there's some interesting thoughts about that. The first one is trying to figure out if he meant Goldman Sachs, that one specific banking financial entity, or if he means Goldman Sachs and the other entities like them. That wasn't clear. But let's just pretend for the sake of argument that the truth of the matter here is that it's Goldman Sachs alone. And that it doesn't matter what nations do because Goldman Sachs will enforce what they want on these nations, right? So it doesn't matter what voters in the United States want because the country's government is powerless to enact any change in the rules if Goldman Sachs doesn't want them, right? Goldman Sachs runs the world. That's the truth. Okay. If we all woke up the next morning and believed this, you know, if you walk out the morning that this news breaks and it's, you know, nobody's even denying it and everybody left, right, center, intellectuals, people on the street, everybody's talking about it. I mean, do you walk out your door that morning in your bathrobe and just sort of go out in the middle of the street and gather with your neighbors and say, what are we going to do now? I mean, the thought that popped into my head, I guess, since we were thinking 9-11 anyway, was of the people, and I don't want a thousand emails saying this didn't really happen. There was no plane. There was a missile. I don't want to go there. But let's, you know, the story that's so accepted about the one plane that never hit anything but the ground in Pennsylvania that was supposedly rushed by the passengers who, you know, kind of in a suicidal attempt to either take it over or, um, you know, keep it from hitting its terror target. You sit there and you wonder at what point those people went from understanding the truth of the situation to acting on it. You know, who stood up first? Who looked at who with some sort of knowing glance? I mean, how did that situation go from concept to action? From realization of what was going on to an attempt to influence what was going on? To me, that's the interesting crux of the issue. That's the important fault line. How do you cross that threshold? concept to action. I used to think that all you needed to do was break on through this truth barrier and the situation would solve itself. But if we woke up tomorrow morning to the news, Goldman Sachs runs the world, what are you going to do about that? You're going to have a little lunch and then call your congressman and say, I don't like the fact that Goldman Sachs runs the world. Do something about that. This is the key. When you start to realize if reality was like A... And A was terrible and worrisome and shocking. What would you do about it? Even if you agreed with all your neighbors, what would you do about it? One week after we all agree Goldman Sachs runs the world, what's happened? Does the government go and take on Goldman Sachs because enough of us called our congressman? I mean, this is where I'm starting to get stuck on this idea of, you know, the fault line between truth, acknowledgement of the truth, and then acting on that information. I don't see the acting coming. And I'm not sure it would come even in the most extreme situations, namely, you know, the news breaking that we weren't really in charge tomorrow morning. Now, this brings me to the protests going on right now over in Wall Street. And several of you emailed me and said, Jan, you're going to talk about the Wall Street protests? I watched a little of the, of the coverage of these the small group of people um, protesting outside Wall Street. And I tried to read, you know, what they want. And there's sort of a manifesto kind of idea about how the greed of Wall Street and all that is, is, is steamrolling regular people and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's an old and um, understood sort of critique. There are people in the 1920s who would have understood it too. And I watched this 
little protest. And then this morning there was news that some of the other cities around the country ha- were having like sympathy protests and whatnot. But again, tiny little groups of people. I mean, you go back to the late 60s and you could get 300,000, 400,000 people at these massive protests that just shook the country. And, you know, you'll get 80 or 100 or 200. I don't know what it is in, in Washington, but part of the problem is when you look at it, you just go, it's a few people. What's going on there? And if you're the guys in Wall Street, for example, if you're Goldman Sachs and you run the world, that doesn't scare you. As a matter of fact, you look at it and you think maybe that even maybe that even just makes the whole thing look even that much sillier. Right. Um, Yeah. Show more coverage of those people. Show how pathetic and small it is and how little they can do and how a bunch of ragtag people chanting slogans. Just show that. Great. That'll dissuade any more people coming out. There was one of these um, kinds of protests in my own neck of the woods the other day, and I'm passing by the local courthouse and there's like three people holding signs saying we want peace and i honked my horn thinking these people have given up their day to go out there and make a statement and look at just those poor three people it looks pathetic it looks like that's all you can muster nothing more depressing than that but i thought to myself what if those wall street protesters had company what if they made a phone call and i think they'd probably have to be the ones who made the phone call to the Tea Party people. And by the way, I do not mean the people that the Koch brothers are backing. I don't mean these people that have been co-opted as an arm of the Republican Party. You may remember when this whole Tea Party thing started, there was a large contingent of people who did not fit our current concept of the Tea Party group and who quickly sort of dropped away once it was co-opted. A lot of libertarians in that group, by the way. Um, Call those people up. And say, look, I know we don't agree on much. And I know our concept for what kind of a country we want is different. But the only way we're going to be scary to the people you know, that we need to scare, and the only way we're going to be a force that politicians and pundits and you know, the political class needs to pay attention to, is if we you know, drop the division and start working together. We can fight about the specifics later. Can we all agree that we're not running the country? I mean, if Goldman Sachs were running the country like that, you know, Wall Street purported, Wall Street guy said, wouldn't you have to make common cause with the rest of the citizens in the country and just say, look, we'll fight later. We can't let Goldman Sachs run the country. Don't we all think that the country needs to be run by the voters of the country? Is there anybody who doesn't think? Let's just take anyone who thinks that the voters of the country shouldn't be running the show outside the debate. Those people are not on our side. But anybody who thinks that the voters of the USA should be running the show, that's something that can unite us right there. There's change that can be made on that basis alone if we could just agree on that. There are people who keep us divided, folks, on purpose. They do it professionally. Turn on your television. They have a guy from the right and a guy from the left or a gal from the right and a gal from the left and they sit there and eviscerate each other. And while they do that, they essentially cast some sort of aspersions upon the whole groups of Americans that think that that person they're talking to is correct. And we rip another hole in the fabric of the country. We divide the population further at a time when we're all suffering together. The doomsday device, you know, for Goldman Sachs, if they were running the world, would be us all dropping our little differences for now. And deciding that we can talk after we get rid of Goldman Sachs. Unity is the scariest thing to some segments of our society out there. Political unity. And I would say it's an actual way to identify the agencies that we the people should be afraid of. They're the ones who would think that unity amongst Tea Party members and Wall Street protesters is the scariest thing that they can think of. Those people are the ones we need to get a handle on. Whoever they are. The big banking company, um, Citigroup, several years ago, and many of you are already aware of this, put out an interesting internal memo, since pulled from the internet, but there are copies floating around, talking to insiders about how the United States has become what they called a plutonomy. I thought plutocracy was supposed to be the word, but they called it a plutonomy. And the internal memo was geared towards... You know, how you deal with this new reality if you're Citigroup. You know, how do you invest around it? How do you maximize your returns and blah, 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 blah. But folks, a plutonomy or plutocracy obviously means a country ruled by a wealthy class of super, you know, wealthy people. If that's true, 
If we live in a plutonomy or a plutocracy, isn't that something that would be just as upsetting to Tea Party protesters as Wall Street protesters? If you woke up this morning and Goldman Sachs were running the place, wouldn't you, you know, need to make common cause with your citizens to fight that reality? Well, what if it's not Goldman Sachs? What if it's Citigroup's idea of a plutocracy or plutonomy? Don't we have a vested interest in not destroying that? This is where I think a lot of the problem lies. People think we have to smash it if you're one of these Wall Street protesters. You don't have to smash it. The rich provide the engine that keeps a lot of the, you know, modern rich world going. But they need to be, you know, subject to the control of the citizenry, not the other way around. We don't want to be a country ruled by the rich and powerful. We want to be a country ruled by the people who has a large, functioning, healthy, you know, rich and powerful, you know, segment to it.